Indeed. Well, I wanted to pick up on that, um, the negative implications of this so-called decay of power. And let's look at the United States in particular and the dilemma that faces President Obama. Here's a man, the, uh, the most powerful man in the world, one could argue, but at the same time, he's so constrained by Congress, by the Republican opposition in the House of Representatives. I mean, what to do with this, uh, the decay of, of power in this, in this sense? What does, what does a head of state do like President Obama? Before answering that, and just to reinforce your presumption, your assumption, there was a wonderful, very interesting interview before the recent election with uh, President Obama uh, with a great journalist called Michael Lewis. Uh, and Michael Lewis was interviewing President Obama in the residence in the White House, in, in the living quarters of the White House, and they were just sitting there and talking about the presidency and power. And at some point, President Obama, in a very reflective mode, said, do you see that patio over there? Well, that patio was the, uh, built by Ronald Reagan. He one day decided it would be nice to have a patio there, and they built it. I cannot think about doing that. Uh, I, I, I feel that if I now make any major change, in the White House, uh, uh, there will, it will become a national debate and I will be distracted from uh, doing or talking about things uh, that are matters of policy that are very substantial. So that is just reinforces the notion of how a mega power like the President of the United States feels constrained and more limited of what he can do than uh, the predecessors. What, what to be done? What is to be done? Uh, I believe that the, we have been going down a path in the United States and in other democracies where the lack of trust uh, in institutions, in politicians, uh, there is a whole slew of reasons where the, all the surveys show that voters and citizens don't trust their government, they don't trust their political parties, the politicians, the institutions. Even the Supreme Court of the United States has been declining in terms of trust uh, by the citizens of the United States. In order to compensate for that lack of trust, or as a result of that lack of trust, there we have been a, seen a surge, an explosion of checks and balances. Because you don't trust the other person, you invent all kinds of rules, all kinds of limitations, all kinds of constraints to the ability of that person to do whatever he or she wants. And so restricting the autonomy of decision makers has been a trend in the United States, and now we're choking on these checks and balances uh, that are indispensable for democracy, and we want checks and balances, but we have been going overboard. And so it is time for us to start thinking about what of these limits, these controls, these restrictions on the authority and the ability and the autonomy of uh, the president ought to be revised, reviewed, or essentially eliminated. Well, Moises Naim, that leads me to ask you about the implications of the decline of power at the international level. Syria comes to mind, particularly as it, re as it um, relates to what uh, the so-called friends of Syria can or cannot do with regard to trying to put an end to the conflict. Whereas, on the other hand, Russia and Iran are, have no uh, compunction about arming their ally Bashar al-Assad and the international community that would like to see um, you know, a political transition and to help the, the opposition, which was a peaceful opposition to begin with, to give them some support. So what do the Syrian massacre, the Syrian tragedy, uh, the European economic crisis and climate change have in common? What do they have in common? Well, there are all three are events that we need to stop. We need to stop the killings in Syria. We need to stop the economic crisis in Europe. And we need to stop um, drifting towards a situation of uh, polluting the, uh, the, the, the atmosphere in a way that is going to deepen the climate change accidents and, and, and the survival even of the planet. So these are things that everyone agrees need to be stopped and they are not being stopped. Why? No one has the power to stop them. And that is a very good example of your uh, central question, which is what happens with the decay of power at the international level. 
what is happening is that because the way the world is evolving and because of globalization and the integration of countries and the, inter the deeper interdependence of countries, the number of problems, of challenges that cannot be solved by any country acting alone has soared. We have a long list of problems that require international collaboration, that require, require nation states to get together and work because no one can solve them alone. Climate change cannot be solved either by the biggest superpower in the world, the United States, or by China. They need to work together with others. And at the same time that the number of problems is increasing, the ability of the world to work together to get that collective actions that are effective at dealing with the problems is either stagnant or dwindling. That gap between the need for effective action and the capacity of the world for effective action is the most dangerous deficit we, fa we, we face as humanity. And, and the reason that is happening is because the people sitting around the tables that make those decisions representing governments uh, are very weak at home. But uh, it also favors uh, more authoritarian regimes. It, it gives them greater leeway to act in contrast to democracies, which have to deal with all these so-called, you know, insurgent micro powers that are constraining them. In the short run, you're right. Uh, in the long run, what we're seeing is that autocracies are not faring that well. In fact, they are going out of business. The number of autocracies has plummeted uh, in the last 20, 30 years. Uh, and, and even those that survive are more limited in what they can do. Ask yourself, why is it that Vladimir Putin in Russia uh, has all kinds of events that try to create the illusion that Russia is a democracy? You know, they have elections, and then he is the prime minister, then he becomes the president, and he's president. They, you know, they have all kinds of efforts to get the seal that they are a democracy. And they still have people in the streets, and they still have all kinds. And he is certainly a very powerful head of state. And yet even Vladimir Putin has limits on what he can do that he didn't have in the past. And the same you can argue is happening in a lot of autocracies that are now also being uh, affected by the more the mobility and the mentality revolutions in their own countries that are, are making things, uh, are making harder to uh, wield power on those populations.